first chapter of the Bible is the foundation upon which the balance of the Word of God is constructed. Genesis chapter 1 contains the record of the history of the universe insofar as its commencement is concerned. The Bible states, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That refers to the original rudimentary elements of which the universe consists. On that initial phase of the creation, the earth was not in the form which it now has. Because the record says, the earth was without form, and it was void or empty. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the Holy Spirit of God began to brood or move upon the face of the deep. And so the divine organizational process was commenced. And God said, let light exist. And light came into being. And I would remind you, that this was not the light of the sun, nor the stars, nor the moon. For those heavenly luminaries were not created until the fourth day of the same week. But it was some magnificent light source that was so fixed with reference to its relationship to the earth that the record says that it served to distinguish day from night. On the second day of the initial week, God separated waters from, uh, or those that were upon the earth from those that were in the atmosphere above. He called the dry land earth, and He made seas. On the third day, the wonderful world of greenery came into existence. God spoke to the earth, and said, Earth, sprout, sprouts. And it was so. Green meadows came into being, stately forests and lovely flowers. The whole world of botany sprang into existence. On the fourth day of the creation week, God spoke into existence the chandeliers that were to illuminate the night skies, the millions of stars, and of course our own life-breathing sun, and the moon to light the night. On the fifth day of the week, God brought into existence marine life, fish, and then also birds with their lovely songs, to wing their ways above the earth. Then finally, on the sixth day of divine activity, God made land creatures, wild beasts of the jungle and of the forests. And then also those domesticated animals that were to serve man in all their splendid ways. But then, wait, wait a minute. He is not finished. The Bible says then, the Lord said in Genesis 1.26, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, male and female. Moses writes that it was so. And of course, in a complimentary record in the next chapter, Genesis 2.7, the Bible says Jehovah God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God saw there was not good for the man to be alone, so he opened up his side and did surgery. Took out a bone and some flesh, for the Hebrew word indicates both. And from it he made woman, woman, meaning out of man. And Adam awoke from his 
divine anesthesia and said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. I want to focus for a few moments on Genesis 1.26, particularly on the phrase, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The moon is not in the image of God nor the sun. The happy valleys and sparkling streams are not in the image of God. No fish, no bird, no monkey, no tiger, no cow is in the image of God. But you are, dear brother, dear sister, dear human fellows, we are in the image of God. Have you ever attempted to plumb the depths of that? To explore the ramifications of what it means to be in the image of God. Before I look at it, let me briefly say, remind us all, that we are not in the physical image of God. The passage doesn't have to do with man's physical aspect. Because God is not human. God is not man. God does not consist of flesh and blood and bone and sinew and tissue and corpuscles and all of those things. Hear the testimony of our Lord in John 4, 24. God is spirit. Our common Bible's State it like this, God is a spirit. But actually there's no A there in the original. God is, as to His essence, His nature, God is spirit. Underline that. Couple with it Luke 24, 39, where Jesus elsewhere said, listen to Him, a spirit does not have flesh and blood as you behold me having. God is a spirit, but a spirit's not flesh and blood. Therefore, God is not flesh and blood. Our Mormon friends need to read that and believe it because they teach that God originally was a man who became God. And that is not so. In Hosea 11.9, God said through His prophet, I am God and not man. Could it be any clearer than that? I don't think so. So when we read in the Bible that we are in the image and likeness of God, we've got to look beyond the physical. There's something about us beyond the physical that is in the likeness or image of God to some extent, to some degree. That ought to challenge me. It ought to thrill me. Right down to the very bottom of my feet. In what ways are we in the image of God? Let me suggest a few items, if I may, and explore these possibilities with you. First, we are creatures of volition. Write it down. Volition. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that we are creatures who have been granted true choice. We have a decision-making capacity. Animals really don't. Animals operate, we say, for example, on the basis of instinct. When a bird flies south for the winter, it never has to be taught how to do that. It can go thousands of miles and spend the winter and return to the very same tree or the very same barn in the spring of the year. All instinct. While it may be true that human beings have some level of instinct, for example, a baby doesn't have to be taught to nurse. They just know how when they're born. It's, we might say, instinctual. Be that as it may, nevertheless, human beings operate mostly by learning. And as we learn, as we develop conscience, 
We have the ability to make choices. Why are you here this morning? Well, if you're a responsible adult, you're here because you chose to be here. Some of the children maybe didn't. But we choose to do what we want to do. We have true power of choice. If you want to buy a car, you go buy it. You choose and go buy a car. If you want an ice cream cone, choose and go buy an ice cream cone. We are true creatures of choice. How is that so? We're unique in that regard. Because God has granted us that ability. It's a part of our soul. It's a part of our spirit. It's a part of that intellectual makeup which we have that is in the image of God. Now, a lot of people would like to repudiate that concept and believe that they are not creatures of choice. That they are kind of checkers on a big universal checkered board and they're just moved about by forces. The Darwinists, those who believe in the theory of evolution, maintain that our lives have been so programmed by our animal ancestry, that we really don't have any true decision-making capacity. When a person goes out here and murders someone or acts in a brutal, violent way, why, he couldn't help that. It was just his jungle ancestry sort of moving him as a pawn in life's cruel game. That is not so. I've been reading recently the writings of Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell was an atheistic philosopher who died just a few years ago. A very influential man. Taught for some time at the University of California. Uh, operated out of Great Britain for a good number of years. But as an atheistic philosopher, Bertrand Russell taught that we do not have free will. Don't have free will at all. Choices are made for you and you just react and act depending upon your environment. Edward Wilson of the University of California has initiated the theory known as sociobiology. And he says all of your activity is programmed in your genes. And just like you cannot decide whether or not your hair will be straight or curly or your eyes brown or blue or various other genetic qualities, even so you cannot decide how you will act and live. It's programmed in your genes. All of these theories are devilish in that they are designed to relieve man of any sense of personal accountability. Wouldn't it be comfortable to think, well, I'm not responsible for what I do. Lay the blame on somebody else. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't make you do it. He might have lend his influence in that direction. But you have the power of choice because you are in the image of God. And so Joshua the great successor of Moses would say to the children of Israel on the eastern side of the Jordan River, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of our ancestors or Jehovah, choose you this day whom you will serve. That is a very valuable aspect of our makeup in the image of God. In the second place, let me suggest that we are in the intellectual image of God. Now be careful. When I say that, I don't mean that we are as brilliant as God. I don't believe that our minds are comparable to His at all. For instance, in 1 John 3.20, the Bible says, God knows all things. You don't, do you? I surely don't. There's more I don't know than I do. But God is a knowing being. He is capable of true knowledge. And so are we. Because we have been fashioned in His image. Now, there are a number of different aspects to the intellectual uniqueness of man. For example, we can reflect upon our past. What are our roots? 
Remember Alex Haley wrote that great book several years ago, Roots. People are interested in their background. When I was home in Tennessee the other day, in my father's house, there is a great big red book, massive, thick, and it's called The Jackson Family. And I started reading that. I was interested in it. I can go back six generations and the family of Andrew Jackson, the President of the United States, ties in with ours. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> yes. I went all the way back through the genealogies and I read that there were some twins way back there whose names were Cain and Abel Jackson. I don't know if that's the original ones or not. I don't know if their name was Jackson or not. But we're interested in our past, aren't we? Did you ever know a, a donkey or a dog who was interested in his own pedigree? We're interested in animals' pedigrees, but they don't care. They have no sense of the past, no sense of history at all. And they don't care where they're going. They don't have a clue as to what their future will be, and they're not the slightest bit interested in it. But we are. We plan for the future. And we have a longing for eternity in our breast. That's a part of the intellectual makeup of man. And we're capable of being truly educated and accumulating education. Let me make this point. Did you know that whatever, quote, knowledge that animals have, and I use the word knowledge probably in a loose sense, but whatever knowledge they have, the next generation of dogs won't have any more than this one. They don't pass it on from generation to generation. We build on the knowledge of each succeeding generation. But animals, since they merely have what we call perceptual knowledge and not conceptual knowledge, they are limited to only what they, quote, know in each generation. But we can truly be educated. You can train a dog to fetch the newspaper, but you can't train him to read it, and you can't train him to understand why he was to go get the newspaper. Unless it's some simple signal like I'll give you a cookie if you do, or swatch you with the paper if you don't. But there's no true education so far as animals are concerned. But we can learn, and we can pass our knowledge on to others. We are unique in terms of our intellect. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because we are in the image of the intelligent God. And ladies and gentlemen, there is not a philosopher in this world that can explain this unique characteristic of human beings in glaring distinction to animals. It's unique. We are intellectually in the image of God. Thirdly, The aesthetic image of God. What is aesthetic? What are aesthetics? It is an appreciation for beauty. You can admire the lovely. You can appreciate art. You can bask in a sunset, you can be enchanted by the fragrance of a rose. All of the things that God has put on this earth, many of which seem to have no functional or practical purpose, but they do have an aesthetic purpose. They appeal to a side of man that goes beyond dull facts. 2 plus 2 equals 4, A, B, C, etc. Man has an aesthetic sense. Animals do not. Animals never, never take care of themselves. No 
male dog when he goes out to find a female companion ever takes a bath or puts on lotion or tries to spruce himself up in any way. Personal aesthetics is not a part of the animal kingdom. But human beings, if they're rational and if they're trained, have an appreciation for the aesthetic. Nobody can explain where that comes from. According to the evolutionary concept, which maintains that we develop traits for a survival factor, there is no survival in aesthetics. It's not essential for our survival. Why then do we have an appreciation for art or music or a painting? We're unique in that regard. At least most of us are. Did you read not too terribly long ago about a woman who attached a paintbrush to her dog's tail, backed him up to a canvas, and had him paint a painting, and she entered it into a show and won a prize. Which doesn't speak very highly for the judges. But it goes to show that we are a part of a modern philosophical world which says that there are no standards and everybody just interprets things in their own light. Subjectivism, existentialism is the order of the day. And if you think something is beautiful, then it is beautiful. And if you think it means something, then it must mean something. And so standards are stowed away. But the unique quality of human beings to have aesthetic values is a commentary upon the way in which we've been created. Fourthly, Human beings are in the moral image of God. What do I mean by that? I mean right and wrong. Right and wrong. The Bible teaches that God is a holy being. In Isaiah 6, 3, the divine angelic that surrounded the heavenly throne said regarding God, holy, 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 is Jehovah, and the whole earth is full of His glory. Similarly, in the book of Revelation, chapter 4 and verse 8, voices around the throne of God said, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Him who was and is and is to come. God is a holy being. And rightness and wrongness are measured by His nature. And He has implanted in us something that we call a conscience. A level of moral sensitivity that exists in every rational person and always will unless rationality is completely snuffed out and an individual loses all sense of what's right and wrong. And I don't know for sure whether that ever occurs or not, but I suspect theoretically that it could occur psychologically speaking. I saw an interview on television not terribly long ago with Charles Manson. And of course, I can't look into his soul, but I could not detect any sense of moral respectability whatsoever from him in that interview. But I'll tell you one thing, if it's gone, it once existed. Human beings have a sense of right and wrong. Now, we don't know what right and wrong are. In other words, we are not the dictionary to define that. We can't come up out of our own minds with a code book that says this is right, this is wrong. That's not my point. God determines that and He has spoken of it through His divine revelation, the Bible. My point is we have a sense that there is a right and a wrong. For example, we say, you ought to share. I mean, that's generally recognized throughout the world. You ought to share. You have two apples. I don't have any. You ought to share. Why? Because human beings have a sense of oughtness. It's an amazing thing to me that atheists can write that there is no God and there is no moral standard, and yet in the same essays, they can say you ought to do thus and so. 
You ought to do thus and so. I mentioned a moment ago Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell wrote an essay entitled What I Believe. And in that essay he said this, Aside from human desire, there is no standard of moral conduct. Now get that. Aside from human desire, there is no moral standard. I have a book written by his daughter. Her name is Kathleen Tite. And she wrote a book called My Father, Bertrand Russell. And in that book she says, she came to her father one day and she said, Father, uh, I have a male friend and we're thinking about sleeping together. Should I or shouldn't I? He said, do you love him? She said, no. He said, I then don't think you ought to. You ought, he said, to save your body for someone you love. Why do you say that? Because it's different. In philosophizing from an ivory tower, there is no moral standard aside from human desire. Well, what if she had desired to have him in the absence of love? He said, you ought not to do that. There's a difference in philosophizing about it and bringing it home to one of your children, isn't it? He couldn't live with that. Moral sensitivity is a part of our makeup because we were created by a moral God. And the further we get away from Him and His instruction, the worse we'll be. But the closer we get to His book, the closer we get to Him in worship and service, the better we ought to be. We'll never be perfect in the flesh. We'll never overcome all of our weaknesses and problems here, but we'll always have the sensitivity that combined with the instruction of His Word can bring us closer and closer to Him. Let us create man in our image and after our likeness. Finally, I would conclude with this point. Being created in the image of God, I am confident, means that somewhere in the human bosom, even if only in a tiny nook and corner for some, there is a sense of incompleteness without God. Some have described it like this, that human beings are theocentric, meaning God-centered, God-centered. Somebody else has described it like this, you can take a compass, you know, and the needle always points to the north, and with your finger you can move it to another direction. But just as soon as the finger is removed, it will go back towards the north. And individuals through uh, atheistic influences and philosophical skeptical premises, they can have their attention distracted from God. They can say, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in religion, blah, 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 I don't believe in your Bible, etc., but then when that deliberate restraint is removed and they meet some deep, dark crisis in their life, in many instances, the needle goes back toward that influence. One infidel is reputed to have said in his dying hour, Oh God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. Isn't that pathetic? It really is, but it still is a commentary too on the urging. As far back as Cicero in the first century B.C., philosophers have made the general observation that religion is a part of all 
cultures and tribes of men wherever they are throughout the whole earth. There is no such thing as an atheistic people anywhere. There are atheistic individuals. But theism, belief in the divine, is a universal trait. Where did it come from? It's the fruit of a seed that was planted in the human soul when God said, let's make man in our image and after our likeness. We'll never be at peace. We'll never know what the meaning of our existence is apart from the divine. Oh, this is a marvelous passage. Marvelous passage. Genesis 1, 20. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So rich and overflowing. Reflect upon that verse this week and let us resolve to try to live a higher level of human existence as a result of the meaning of that passage.